got other, other jobs that you have to take care of as you're morning. We need you up here. <coughs> this was our theme song two months back, and I come to love this song. Call us from the outer court, Lord. I want to get in close to Jesus. I don't know where, how you feel about that, but as time goes on and things are changing in our world, there's one thing that's true that Jesus never changes and he's always the same that he always loves us and uh, I'm so thankful for that this morning and I believe with all my heart the only way that we're going to make it when we face trials and tribulations in this life is to get real close to Jesus and that comes through getting uh, with him from all from the outer court into the inner court where Jesus is and I'm so glad for that this morning let's worship him as we sing this morning Song, let's do this is your house, and then we'll go to call the outer courts. This is your
All right. This morning, I would like to talk to you a little, a little bit about biblical authority. Sounds like an exciting topic, doesn't it? Biblical authority. And uh, you know, pastor's gone, so as they say, when the mouse, when the when the cat's away, the mice play, right? So we can talk about it. And uh, that's what I intend to do this morning. Okay. Um, you know, there's a lot of areas in our um, in our lives that I believe, as we're, we're human, we live in this world, and yes, we know things about God and we have the Word, but we're here's where we live right now. And I believe that it's a constant battle in the life of a Christian to constantly allow the Word to renew our minds and to cleanse our minds and to focus our minds on God. Because in so many areas of our, our thinking is influenced by the world that we live in. Um, a lot of us grew up hearing the term worldliness. When we heard that term, our minds sort of zipped over to one or two specific things that we perceived as being worldly. But, you know, I would say that there are so many areas where this world system and worldliness can creep into our thinking and the way we live and the way we act and the things that we do and how we go about our lives, and we don't even realize it. And Satan's happy if, he, if we aren't doing 20 or 15 things that we think this is worldly, but we're doing all the rest of them. That's, that's fine with him. And so I think that that's where the Word comes in. That's where God's Word allows us to... Um, continue to have our minds to be renewed and to be transformed, as it says in Romans, by the renewing of your mind. So, this area of a biblical authority that I want to talk to you about this morning, I believe is one of those areas where we need to have that transformation occur. Um, let's go back and let's just think about the way things were um, when the church started there was no question who was in charge in the world. At that point in time, the Roman Empire ruled everywhere. And if you spoke um, against the Roman Empire and you raised up um, a, a rebellion, they would bring out the soldiers and they would kill you. Um, they didn't have the, uh, well, I can't think of what that, uh, that organization that goes around in um, Amnesty International or whatever, whatever these things are, you know, they go out and and uh, make sure that the that or they, they they only make sure that some prisoners, some countries, they don't even go there. But they try to make sure that you know everybody's fairly treated. They didn't have that back then. Um, if you spoke against the authorities, um, there were dire consequences for you. In Jewish society, there were uh, dire consequences. Think about the man that Jesus healed and um, gave him back his sight. His he got kicked out of the synagogue, and his parent his parents were terrified of the Jews. They didn't want to I said, well, we, we know this is our son, but we don't know how he got healed. They, they were very afraid. So there was a lot of fear there. So the people understood authority, and they lived with it every single day. Um, women had no rights in the, in the larger world. They were, by, in many cases, considered to be property. And it was just a difficult and dark time. And so into this world comes the gospel and comes the preaching of the word. And, and people are standing up and saying very um, unusual things like there's no male or female, um, Jew or Gentile. And, uh, you know, this, is, this was super countercultural stuff to the thinking of that day. In fact, it brought on all kinds of problems. You had people in the church that you had slaves sitting here and you had their masters sitting here. And the slaves were like, well, equal in Christ, I shouldn't have to listen to him anymore. And so Paul, they have to begin to teach about how to, how to relate one to another. Um, slaves, honor your masters and masters. Um, and and they, they were just, they had to begin to teach all these new, these new principles that were brought on by the scripture. And so there would begin to be a transformation and it really literally affected the entire world. Now, today, um, the uh, liberals and those that, uh, with, that sit in their little in their little ivory towers and teach everybody, they'll tell you that the reason that people are enslaved today is because of Christianity. But they're lying to you. It's not true. So anyway, biblical authority. So there's a lot of teaching about this. 
Now today, we have seen, and I believe in, in the church especially, and especially probably in the American church, we have a lot of messed up ideas about authority. We've seen authority abused. We've seen authoritarianism. We've seen people who stood up in the pulpit, said things that were not true, and used the scripture as a sword to slice and dice and destroy people. And we know that that's not um, the way that God intended for authority to, to work. You know, there's authority that God has placed in all levels, um, in the home, in the church, and um, amongst the, the leaders of the church. And so I think it's really important that we get this concept um, clear. Another area that is uh, where authority is confused, as many of you know, a few years ago, we had a young man, um, James, who lived with us for almost, I think it was almost nine or ten months. And um, I talked to James a lot, and I realized after a few months that this young man had no sense of what loving authority was. He'd come in contact with authority and it had abused him. It had hurt him. And so he was sort of on an anti-authority quest. And when loving authority came along, he just it looked just like any other authority and it got rejected. And um, I think it's the same way for us in the church sometimes. If we have had bad experiences with people using, misusing authority, we tend to react you know, we humans, we react all the time. Instead of allowing ourselves to be, and, and the scripture, we need to react to this. But we tend to react to all kinds of things. And when we react, we always overreact. I was driving down the road a while back, and a deer ran out in front of me. And so I slammed on my brakes, and my car went clear sideways, and I let go, and it went clear back that way. And I thought it was all over. I thought I was going to go in the ditch backwards. And uh, at the last minute, it, it recovered, and uh, there was this nice gentleman driving right behind me. He saw me swerving all over the road. He drove right by, didn't help me, didn't stop, nothing. That was John DeCore. I just thought I'd mention that. But anyway, <laughs> he was just back far enough that he didn't know it was me, so I was fine. <laughs> but see, I, there, was a, there was a lot of overcorrecting and, and reacting back and forth to what was going on, and I think in our lives we do that a lot. We tend to overreact the other direction. And uh, John, I had to throw you under the bus. You know, it's typical. <clears throat> so, back to authority. Um, we need to balance those, that tendency to swing back and forth in, author in authority. We need to understand what that is. And in, our, in the church, we obviously, the most common sense of authority that we would see is the pastor. The pastor is um, has a place of authority, and um, that's a th th this is a crucial understanding. I think, you know, God set our church um, in motion. I believe, and a lot of prayer and a lot of um, passion, a lot of vision, God gave to us. And um, but you know, we functioned for about eight months um, without a pastor. How many of you were there, were here attending during that time? I want to see hands. Okay, so still at least half, if not, if not a slight majority. Well, I know that for the different times that I had to speak, including this morning, I'm very thankful for a pastor who has the gift of being able to preach and teach. Um, and that was always one of the scary things when we were getting started, is we were kind of sitting in the, in the room having a meeting, leadership team meeting, we were looking at us and saying, so who's going to speak Sunday? And it was kind of like, is it you? No, not me. Okay, maybe you. Or, and we had to take our turns. And then we, we got, uh, we got the, because the pressure was there, we went out to try to find other people to help us out, you know. So that, that's always one area, you know, that, that I'm thankful for. But as I think about the authority of a pastor and reacting properly to that authority, I want to take you to a verse in Hebrews. Wayne, can you just pop that one verse, or part of a verse, actually? up on the screen. And I think that this is one of the foundations for our understanding of biblical authority and how that plays out on every level from the pastors to leaders in the church to Christians to parents to husbands and wives so many areas of our lives. 
And I left the first part of the verse off on purpose. We'll get back to that. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. That's a sobering verse for people who are in leadership, in Christian leadership. Because what that teaches is, is that when we are judged by God, we will have to give an account for those whom we were put in, in authority over. I've worked at a few places where I was just the lowest guy on the totem pole. Um, I kind of, at this point in time, I, they say I'm my own boss, but I think it's more like I'm, everybody else is my boss, and I'm just the guy that does the work. Because uh, it doesn't matter if I'm, and, and don't feel bad, I'm not picking on you. <laughs> But no matter where I am, no matter what I'm doing, I can get that phone call. <laughs> and Ann has the bad luck of having a problem any time I'm ever uh, I'm doing something. Family fun day, I get a call from Ann. But it worked out fine, didn't it, Ann? It worked out fine. So. <laughs> but anyway, um, back to biblical authority. There is a responsibility that comes with that, with that authority. And we've all worked in places where We've had someone who was in what was what is termed by leadership experts to have positional authority. And all that means is your name is here on the org chart and their name is here. They're the boss and you're but I have seen in churches and businesses, I've seen people who were down here on the bottom, and they were actually up here when it came to actual leadership and authority. Um <clears throat> So, Wayne, you can testify to some of that, can't you? Wayne works in a situation where there's, there's a lot of issues with authority. Um, people who should make the calls don't make the calls, and so everybody else suffers under that situation. But true authority is something that when, when biblical loving authority is exercised, the person who, gets, who has the authority needs to have this principle firmly embedded in their mind. And it's not just about, I'm the boss, you have to listen to me. But it's about a charge that's been coming down right from God to that leader who then has a responsibility to the people that he's supposed to lead. They have to give an account. You know, I think that um, in America especially, that we have um, we have wrestled with this in the church. You know, our nation was founded in a rebellion. We were coming out from under what our founders considered to be unreasonable authority. Uh, we could talk all day about the fact that what we have now is probably a lot worse than what they had to deal with then um, because we sort of have traded in one boss for a new boss in some ways, and we could talk a lot about that. But that, that um, thing that our nation was founded in was a throwing off of the of the um, control of England over the United States. And we've talked a lot about freedom and, and we understand these concepts and I think sometimes they can blend over top of the biblical understanding in the church. And we can try to take what we've learned in the business world, what we've learned in politics and we make them work in the church. And they don't because the scripture is what is supposed to reign preeminent there. So you know what, we are to be under authority. And you know why? When you put yourself under authority, it allows God to work in your life. Um, because what God does is he corners us in spots where we're in authority, and then he can begin to put and, and impact our lives with truth. You know, when a pastor comes up here every Sunday morning with a message, um, God supernaturally works through his words. He gives him ideas. He gives him anointing as he speaks. But what he does is he really applies things to our God, applies things to our hearts that Pastor never intended when he spoke to He may have intended part of it, but I know I've been sitting in many messages where something came and it hit me, and it wasn't even really, when I look back at the outline or what was on the screen, it wasn't even really what the Pastor was saying, but it was what God knew that I needed that day, and he used Pastor Keaton or other pastors I've had in the past to say those words, and then he applied it to my heart. So there's something supernatural that happens when a leader, when a pastor stands before a congregation 
because God enters into that equation and he begins to work in our lives. And that's crucial. There was a time in our nation where there was high respect for pastors and leaders. And unfortunately, those days are gone. And one of the reasons that those days are gone is because people did not lead from biblical godly authority, but they, they led with hidden sin in their lives. They used their authority to beat people up and to tear people down and to destroy people. And think of all the scandals that have happened over the years of people that are in leadership that have fallen, and they're just everywhere. They're everywhere around as we, as we look at our, our culture. But you know what? The beauty of, of, uh, of serving God is that we can start again to build the church as God intended. Anytime we're, we begin to obey Him, He will begin to rebuild in our own church, in our own lives, in our own understandings, what we need to have, that understanding that we need to have. You know, when we started out here four years ago, those eight months that I think that we went through without that pastor, God was doing some things in our hearts, in our lives, because the way that the church works in America, if, at least this is just my observation, is that we, we trust the pastor to take care of the needs and the things of the church, make it work, make it run, make all the decisions, those types of things. Yes, there are leaders, yes, there are board members, but in our mindset, we see that person that's in charge and we just think, ah, they'll take care of it. You know, we tend to sort of expect them. So when you don't have one of those guys, it becomes you that has to do it. And that was a real experience to kind of sit around in a room with a group of, uh, of people and look at one another and say, all right, how are we, we, we going to do this thing anyway? Um, and again, as I mentioned, having gone through that first eight months, I cannot tell you how happy I was when we had Pastor Keaton come in and stand up here and lead a service because a weight and a relief, I felt that myself and, I, and I, I'd be interested to, to, I'm sure many of you others can share that same thing. But I think that there are some things we've, we've, we need to remember, we need to think back and we need to remember because there were some good elements of, um, of our church when we didn't have a pastor that if we don't maintain those, it will undermine our pastor's authority, his ability to do what God's called him to do, and um, the success of our church. I think it will undermine that. So, I'm going to ask you for some interaction this morning. I'm going to ask you to, what are some things that you can think of that we may have learned as a church prior to having a pastor that can benefit us today? Anybody? Out there, kick your minds out of receive mode and go into send mode here real quick. Any thoughts? I know you all have thoughts. Just wonder if you're willing to share them. One of the big things I see, and it isn't necessarily just past, but being a, a independent sort of, uh, I use that term, it's not that we're trying to assert our but that we are not, not a part of the organization that supports us, you feel the, the need to participate in a different way than you do, I think, when you're part of a big denomination mm -hmm. who has uh, rules and regulations for how everything is to be done, how your business meetings are being conducted, mm -hmm. how your church is to be structured, and uh, they're there also as a financial resource you can fall back on and they'll, they'll help you out you know, yeah. during your rough times. And there's also the prayer support of, of the other people that, uh, that sometimes you don't have and you wish you did. And I think there, there are people in other churches that do pray for us. And I thank the Lord for that. But I think there is a, a, a special sense of, you know, this is, this is up to us. You know, God ultimately has to mm -hmm. be here or it's a failure, but yes. we have to allow God to work in our hearts and lives and be responsive or, or there, will be, there will be nothing. And it, it's uh, perhaps limiting, but also <laughs> uh, we're self-limiting in that mm -hmm. the sky is the limit. Yeah. God, God can do whatever through us we will let him. And 
so there's a, there's a sense of not being limited. Well, another thing too is sometimes wait, when you when you know that the rule for that is on page 47, subparagraph B, the tendency is to get is to not dig it out and understand it out of the word. And I think that's one of the things that that we had to do because of lacking some of that is we had to think, well, what you know, what does the Bible say about this? What should we do? And and I think God works through that. It's very true. Anybody else? Come on now. John. I know you're over there thinking. I know it's dangerous, but I'm willing to take the risk. <laughs> You know, let me just let me just bring your minds back. Keep thinking about that question, but let's just take a. Hopefully, I can keep it down for one minute or one to two minutes here. Just a quick survey of church history. Jesus, Jesus left the disciples. The apostles started the church. They went all over the world and spread the the message, and the church became went from twelve guys following a man around. That, that's what the, it would look like to the world to transforming the world, turning the world upside down was a quote that one person said about, about it's in the scripture, um, and became a, a powerful force in the world. In fact, became one of the most powerful forces in the world through what happened then in the ensuing centuries where we have the church who merged the power of the church with the state and basically became the world ruler. They ruled, the uh, church ruled the world by saying, all right, king, if you don't do this and that, we won't give you communion, therefore you won't make to heaven, you'll go to hell. So the church became the power broker for the entire world. And so out of that, and, and the world was thrown into darkness for a thousand years under that, literally a thousand years. But God reached down and spoke to the hearts of the reformers, brought them back to the scripture, and they read, wow, the just shall live by faith. And they read the words in the scripture, brought them out of that. And they paid for it, many of them, with their lives. They died because they fought against that. And so they came out and they, but what, what did they do? They had to, they couldn't, when you make big changes like that, it's difficult to be balanced people. You study the lives of people like Martin Luther. He was a rough, tough dude. Um, it's, it's really humorous when you read some of the things that he said. But he was, he was um, really afraid of nothing because he single-handedly took on the most powerful force in the world at that point in time. And uh, he wasn't shy about saying it either. But anyway, as these guys began to form churches and, and began to lead out of that, some of them reacted harshly and got away from the authoritarian leadership of the church. Others um, clung to it. And here's a very interesting thing. He moved to John Wesley. John Wesley, who the Wesleyan church, the Methodist, Wesleyan Methodist Church, see as their church father, he still attended the Anglican Church in England. But what he did is he said, I'm going to church on Sunday. I'm going to do my sacraments and things there. But on Monday, 
through Saturday. He was out preaching the word. He was out in the fields ministering, leading small groups of people together to, to grow closer to God. So he put he did his he went to church and did the church thing, but his he he went from just a church on Sunday type of a transactional thing and he went to building the kingdom of God every day and living that every day. And I think that's a model that we need to to re revive because yes, we have church and God works through the Sunday morning, Sunday night, the, the things of the, the building and the church that we've made in America that, you know, in our culture that's accepted. But we've got to remember that this is a day-by-day -day thing. Yes, the pastor has authority and the leadership, God works through them. But you know what? When you were at work, working with those of your co-workers who don't know the Lord, and you have the Spirit of God in you, you have, an, you have a responsibility to lead them to the Lord. You have a responsibility to show Christ. And I believe we'll all give account for that as well. So we have to see ourselves as ministers of Christ. Whether we're called to stand up here and preach, or stand up here and try to preach like me, um, or whether we're, we're called just to work and do um, help with uh, whatever it is in the church, whatever the responsibilities are, we're leaders too. And we have a pastoral responsibility in that when we have that spirit, I was standing there in this huge crowd at this concert and I just thought, you know, what in the world can I do? What, how can I reach these people? I don't, the gap is so great, but I felt that responsibility and I felt that, that pressure and I felt that realization that as God opens the doors for me, maybe it's just affecting one or two or three or four people here and there. I've got to be willing to do that. I've got to be willing to answer that call. So I guess I went through that whole that, that thing of the church history of what of the, the huge organizational and the reaction to that where now here we are with all these other little, all these different denominations and such. But you know what? The reality of the fact is is that's what he, that's what happens when humans try to build organizations and try to do things. They do it imperfectly. But there is one perfect church, and Christ is the head of that church. And if you're saved today, you're a member of that church. And one day, we'll all gather around the throne and have a great big worship service together, and all those denominational and, and all those lines are going to be done away with, and it's going to be an amazing day. So anyway, I want to get back, just I want to finish up here, I want to talk to you quickly. October, the month of October is... Um, month of pastor, pastor Appreciation Month. And um, it's a time when we try to let our pastor know that we appreciate it, let our leadership know that we appreciate them. And, um, you know, there's a lot of ideas, there are a lot of ideas of things we can do, you know, as a church to honor our pastor. And I'm sure that we'll do something as a, as a church where we'll, you know, give a card or a gift or we'll make a presentation or something. I'm sure that that will be done. But, you know, just in the everyday things that we do, in calling the pastor up, sending him a text message, just showing him love in practical ways throughout the year, how crucial of a thing that is for us to do. Because, just like this verse says, he's going to give account to our souls. When we, come to, when we come to church, as we sit here in the pews, let's come ready to listen. Let's come with our hearts open. Let's receive the word that God has for us. If the pastor comes to you and shares a, something that he's concerned about in your life, you know what? If we've been hurt in the past, our, our first reaction can be to reject that. But let's open ourselves up. Let's allow God to work through him. If a brother, brother or sister comes to you and with a concern or a problem, be to them a minister. Encourage them. Help them. If they come to you with a criticism, receive it. Allow God to work in your life through it. And, and accept that, that loving authority that God wants to, to bring to bear in your life. Because the next verse says that they may, uh, me, the next part of this verse, I have it here, I think. Let them do this, give this giving account. So it's kind of a picture of that final day standing before God. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that will be no advantage to you. And so what that means is, that means that the way you respond to truth, the way you respond to leadership, the goal is that someday when that leader is able to stand before God, they'll be able to say, Lord, 
I have been able to minister to the people that you gave me. They received my instruction, and here they are. We want them to be able to say, here they are, and, and to see them, us all come in together. So that is the, um, that is the, uh, the, the point that we, that we want to, um, to experience as a church. You know, just a few quick things about leadership. Um, that we shouldn't do. One of the problems that I think is, yes, pastors and leaders have been authoritative, and they have taken advantage of their authority. And thank God we don't have a pastor. We have a pastor that does not do that. But, you know, people, we have a responsibility. We tend to put leaders um, on an unbiblical pedestal. We tend to elevate leaders to a point where we put a higher level of criticism upon their lives than we would ever submit to or allow to be submitted upon us or our families. And that's not loving. It's not Christ-like, and we shouldn't do it. We have a human pastor. He is a man, just like you and I. And yes, God is working in his life, and God gives him a special dispensation of grace, but it's no different than you. It's no different than I. Every morning he has to get up, pray, seek God's face for his help for the day. He doesn't have some super pastor, uh, you know, superpowers that we don't know about. No, he's just a man, and we need to remember that. He's, he has weaknesses, he has faults, but he also is gifted and, and um, anointed to minister to us. Um, expectations. I know pastor's children are grown, but I've always heard from, and I was, never was a pastor's child, but that the pastor's children struggle because they're expected to be perfect. And when they make mistakes, because they're not perfect, then those get put up to the top of the list. Um, we must allow our pastor to have weaknesses. We must not be, oh, no, you know, we see a chink in his armor. Well, we can't use him. No, we can't have that attitude. We have to love him just the same way as we all have faults and need to be loved. Um, because he, pastors can get discouraged. Um, sometimes they don't feel very spiritual. And one of the things that I believe we've got to do is we have to um, communicate that love to him so he knows that no matter if he's feeling on top of the world today, that we, he is still loved and that he is still appreciated. That's just an important thing. Because what happens is, if we do not do that, if we do set our pastor on a pedestal, if we do um, expect a lot more from him than, than, than we biblically should, it can create an unhealthy situation. And this is everywhere in the church. Leaders have problems, but they have to pretend like they don't have any. And years of that produce a, a leader who's isolated, who Satan can beat them up behind closed doors because they have to go out and paste on that smile. And Satan has used it to destroy the church, to destroy and destroy people's lives. A lot of pastors who have fallen, I, don't know, I wouldn't say all, but there's a lot of pastors who have fallen. The reason is because way back when they were struggling with a small situation in their life, they couldn't say, I need help, I need prayer, I've got a problem. They just had to hide behind that facade and years and years of that fake living brought them to the point where they fell. And so I think that's so crucial for us as the people to love our pastor, to pray for him, and to provide that place where he can be himself. <clears throat> we have to listen. This is what this is our action items for, for you. We, have, we cannot reject loving authority. We need to listen to the words of the pastor. Um, and I think one of the greatest things that we can do to hinder God working in our life is say, you know what, if you exert authority on me, I'm out of here. There's lots of other churches I can go to. I don't need this. Um, and that's one of the things that in America has been a real hindrance, I think, to people's spirituality is whenever the, the preaching gets too close and they get too uncomfortable, they can always hit the eject button and go somewhere else. We can't do that. We need to allow God to work in our lives. And you know what? These are truths that I wanted to share with you um, that, we, that we can apply to our lives. But you know, we are so blessed because I sat with Pastor and talked with him in small group. 
and in a lot of different circumstances we've sung together. Um, we've encountered difficult things. We've hauled kids around and passed out flyers together. Just a, a wide variety. And on so many levels, Pastor Keaton gets it when it comes to his heart is in the right place. You know, he pastored for 26 years, I believe, in a lot of denominational churches, a lot of churches where he wasn't free to be himself, where he wasn't free to um, have any faults or failings. And he, you know, that was tough for him. And he appreciates that about you and about this church. So don't get the idea I'm just beating you all up that you aren't doing a good job because, because you are. But I just want to encourage you and have, help you think about these things, about biblical authority, to remember that, yes, we do need to come under authority structures, but for those of us that are under authority, remember that those that are above you have to give an account. And for those of you that have children, that, um, that have any position in the church, really all of us, we're going to give account for how we handle that and for um, the souls of those that God's put under our charge. That's what I have to share with you this morning. Um, does anyone else have a thought before we're done um, that you'd like to share? Actually, uh, mind if I read that scripture or the uh, verse? Uh, translation? No scripture reading here. <laughs> yes, go for it. <laughs> this is from the message. Oh. This is Hebrews 13, verse 7. It says, be responsive to your pastoral leaders. Listen to their counsel. They are alert to the condition of your lives and work under the strict, strict supervision of God. Contribute to the joy of their leadership, not its drudgery. Why would you want to make things harder for them? this morning as I droned on. Um, I appreciate and love you all and uh, I'm glad that God has blessed us with the pastor that we have, even if he isn't here today. <laughs> all right, let's stand and uh, let's pray.